Live. Um, so have a great event. Thank you. Thank you. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Sherry Turkle presenting her new book, The Empathy Diaries. She'll be talking with Honor Moore, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Sherry, Honor, and the team at Penguin Press for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping things to go over. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you should be able to see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. There are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. But if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting them there and not in the chat. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Empathy Diaries, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations from 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Sherry's book and many others on site. Or you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the file link in the chat in just a moment. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer for tonight is Honor Moore. Her new memoir, Our Revolution, A Mother and Daughter at Mid-Century is out in paperback this February and her book, Women's Liberation, Feminist Writings That Inspired a Revolution and Still Can, co-edited co with Alex Cape Chulman, is available in hardcover from Library of America. Her other books include three collections of poems, a memoir, The Bishop's Daughter, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and The White Blackbird, A Life of Her Grandmother, the painter Margaret Sargent, a New York Times notable book. She lives in Manhattan and teaches in the graduate writing program at the New School. She will be speaking with our featured author, Sherry Turkle. She is the Abby Rockefeller Mazze Professor of the Social St Studies of Science and Technology at MIT and the founding director of the MIT Initiative on Technology and Self. A licensed clinical psychologist, she is the author of six books, including Alone Together and the New York Times bestseller, Reclaiming Conversation, as well as the editor of three collections, a Miss Magazine Woman of the Year, a TED speaker, and a featured com media commentator, Turkle is the recipient of Guggenheim and Rockefeller Humanities Fellowships and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her new book, The Empathy Diaries, reflects on her coming of age and path blazing career and offers a master class in finding meaning through her life's work. The book has received praise from fellow writers such as Rebecca Goldstein, Alan Lightman, Vivek H. Murthy, and tonight's interviewer, Honor Moore, who says, in this beautiful, compulsively readable memoir, Sherry Turkle, who has asked why we expect more from technology and less from each other, excavates the eras of her continually surprising 20th century life. In her hands, empathy is the instrument of knowledge, illuminating the uses and pleasures of crucial human values now under threat. This story is not only of a woman, but of her humane and exhilarating mind. She, Sherry will be speaking with honor, and then she'll be speaking with all of you. Please take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, there's a moment of silence here. Uh, hello. Uh, I guess I'll just start to talk. Um, hello. All panelists go ahead. Okay. Hi. I don't see Sherry, though. I'm a little nervous that I don't see Sherry. I see um, you. What? I see you. Oh, there you are. There you are. <laughs> hi, Sherry. Yeah, so, hi. The, so the thing is, you know, Sherry and I have only met once in person and it was like a 30 second meeting. It was, oh, we're going to meet for dinner in New York. <laughs> and that was in 2017. And then came 2020. <laughs> we all remember 2020. So we have met through the very machinery that she critiques, which I think is a great irony. Um, and I, um, 
you know, congratulations on the past two days. Yes. You know, just four days ago, you said, oh, I'm not getting a review in the Sunday Times. And then there was like, and then there was like a profile on Monday morning. And then there was like this amazing review. Was that today? Seems like 18 years ago this morning. Anyway, uh, congratulations. And uh, welcome to uh, having written a classic in the genre on your very first time out. But I wanna say that actually there are elements of memoir in your other writing. There is this voice. I mean, I think that the key to memoir writing is voice. And that's what's so extraordinary. One of the things that's extraordinary about this book. The other thing is that it's not only the story of a life, but the story of a life of the mind, uh, which is uh, unusual um, in contemporary memoir. And that is why I wanted you to read um, something, a couple of things from the book, because you know people are gonna love it for your fascinating life and your and its boldface names like Steve Jobs and you know Jacques Derrida, but they're also going to love the really uh, wonderful storytelling of your own of your own life. And um, there's quite a story, and it uh, kind of leaps off the page right at the beginning. So I thought maybe you could read to us from that beginning moment. Okay, this is how my book uh, begins. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And this is how the Empathy Diaries begins. During the long hours of my grandmother's dying, I begin to read the Brooklyn telephone book. I look up the Charles Zimmermans. There are pages of them. I study the entries carefully. It's August, 1975. I'm 27. For as long as I can remember, I've been both searching and not searching for Charles Zimmerman, my father, whom I haven't seen since childhood. Now I'm searching. In the back of one of my graduate school notebooks, I begin to copy down Charles Zimmerman addresses and telephone numbers, long lists of them, my mother is dead and my grandparents with whom I stay when I'm in New York have only the Brooklyn telephone book, no Manhattan directory. I know that in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one of my Harvard professors has the Manhattan directory in his office. He once commented that everyone needs to have that directory at hand. At the time, this idea suggested a life of access and sophistication that thrilled me. Now though, I feel a more practical need. When I get back to school, I ask his secretary if I may borrow his Manhattan book. She says no, but she lets me sit with it in his office where I carefully copy out new Zimmerman candidates. My grandmother dies in December. At LaGuardia Airport flying back to Boston after her funeral, my plane is delayed. Standing next to a payphone, I study the Queen's directory and copy down the information for all its Charles Zimmermans. It never occurs to me that my father might live in the Bronx or have moved out of New York City altogether. Both during my mother's life and long afterward, I'd respected my mother's wish to keep secret what she considered the great shame of her early divorce. I never spoke of my biological father. More than this, from the time I was five and my mother remarried, this was to Milton Turkle, my family lived under a regime of pretend. The rules were that although my legal name was Sherry Zimmerman, I had to say that my name was Sherry Turkle. I finally met with a private investigator, a former police detective. I no longer remember his name, just his thin black hair and shiny gray suit. In the spring of 1979, I visited his small bare office on the west side, furnished only with a well-used lamp, a coat tree, and a steel desk. 
After Thanksgiving, the detective called. He thinks that he's found my Charles Zimmerman. I remember that as we spoke, I could only take shallow breaths. I was crossing a line. My mother had not wanted me to do this. Perhaps she'd had her reasons. Wow. That is great reading, beautiful reading. Um, and also, you know, this, this, it feels to me as if taking that action, calling up that private detective was the first gesture you made toward writing uh, this memoir. And also, it also, it, in, a, in a way, it, it is, this was the kind of central wound of your uh, life. And I just was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking about a, a poem by Adrienne Rich about Marie Curie. And she says, she died a famous woman denying her wounds, denying her wounds came from the same source as her power. And really the story of this book is how Sherry Turkle becomes, chooses to be Cher Sherry Turkle and also, um, uh, uses that wound to to create her extraordinary um, work. Um, so I, uh, what actually possessed you to write this memoir? Well, it's interesting. In my origin story of the memoir, uh, I date it to a very dramatic encounter that I had after I published my first. Um, book about the computer culture mm -hmm. um and i had just been on the cover of um uh, fortune magazine as uh 40 people under 40 who were changing the nation and mm -hmm. they sent a uh a photographer and they styled it and they gave me clothes to wear that weren't my clothes and they they sent a writer to write kind of a puff piece i guess you call it about me um and he, he, it was, he, they say, he was a psychiatrist because I was sort of a psychologist and they wanted to do something worthy of me. And right. he, he asks me, um, so tell me if the, the, in, the, in the acknowledgements to your book, there's um, that we know about your mother and you, know, you thank all your mentors, but there's nothing about your father. So who's your father? What'd your father do for a living? Well, who's your father? And I say to him, well, I can't talk about my personal life. I can only talk about my work. You know, you're here to discuss my work with me. I can't. And I had just written this book in which the, you know, the hallmark of the book is that thought and feeling can only be discussed together. And that, that's like my brand. That's like my right. brand. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy is like so taken aback. And in fact, he writes a piece for Fortune magazine in which he says, whoa, you know, this Sherry Turkle why put on a mask if there's not something to hide? So he still writes a kind of very sweet piece, but he, you know, says, whoa. And I remember walking him to the door of my office and saying, this has to, number one, this has to end. And I remember calling my half siblings and telling them that I was Sherry Zimmerman, something mm. I'd hidden from them. Oh, you didn't, oh, know that. Wow. They didn't know that yet. You know, I sort of went public to my family. That wow. The secret had to end. They couldn't read about it in a magazine, but I had no. to tell them then. And then second, I remember saying, I need to find a way to tell this story to myself. I have to have this conversation with myself and write this, start to write this down. And that's when I began to take notes to write a memoir. Well, well, you know, it's so interesting to say that because uh, that you say that because what I realized about memoir are, are two things. One is, I, and I say this to my students, right. and they already know it, you know. But I, I say it's not just writing down what happened; it's it's writing the story of figuring out what happened. Yes, and that's what gives a memoir life. I mean, that's yes. why it has vitality. Yes. Because somehow the um, the reader joins in that yes. that 
that search. There's so what? So many, go, there's go so many ahead. things I learned about myself, yeah. about my story, writing the story. I mean, there are things I learned about my story when the book was finished that I didn't put in the book. Like, mm. um, like there's the story of Steve Jobs, and I, I I'm tell asked, that story. I'm asked to I'm asked to write. I'm stu I'm busy studying essentially what Steve Jobs um, knows as his intuition and has made a, making a company about, which is that the computer is an intimate machine. It's not just a tool. Right. And I'm busy studying that, and he's busy making a fortune by you know creating yeah. a technology around that insight. Yeah. And he comes to MIT and he's invited to meet with faculty and I'm a young faculty member studying essentially his thing. And I'm asked to make him a vegetarian dinner. I'm not, so I spend the entire day of the Steve Jobs visit cooking and cleaning and making sure he has his vegetarian dinner and he comes in and all these people, I've made this vegetarian dinner and all these people are there and he looks at the vegetarian food and he basically says, I'm not that kind of vegetarian and he leaves, you know, so I didn't. And you, and you weren't <laughs> invited to the meeting. And I, right, and I was not invited to the meeting with Steve Jobs. I was just asked to make him a vegetarian dinner. And in the book, if you read the book, if you buy yes. the book, yeah. you see the depiction of this story in which I say, I tell the story. And it was only after I was reading the book in what's called blues, where you're not allowed to touch the book, you right. and given instructions, only if I found like, you know, a, a terrible spelling error, I was just given right. it a favor, I could look at it. And I called my editor and I said, Ginny, um, I should say that I was not that I'm angry that I wasn't asked to um, go to, to meet him. That's, the, that's what the story really is about. And I hadn't seen that all these years. As I was writing the book, it was only in reading the book that I realized that I was so into that my role, even as a faculty member, was to I don't know, to be a woman and make dinner for <laughs> visiting celebrities. <laughs> so ridiculous. Well, I mean, that's sort of, you know, that whole ambiguity about uh, being a brilliant woman uh, brings us to our mutual alma mater, right? Yes. Uh, which uh, I always said, you know, oh my God, I got into Radcliffe. And you get into Radcliffe and like you're a second class citizen because right. you're in these classes with the Harvard boys. But uh, I mean, I was really shy and really intimidated and I was a girl, so I wasn't expected to do anything really, you know? And um, so that, that kind of split, am I supposed to be great or am I just supposed to be next to the great? Uh, so, uh, you know, we both were in public high schools uh, when we decided to go to Radcliffe. We were in very different situations. I was going to, I wanted to go to the, the women's college uh, that had been attended by many men on my mother's side of my family for generations. And also the Radcliffe was founded by my great, great grandmother, you know, and it was like, or great, great, great grandmother. And it was like, you know, but I felt like a stranger in a strange land and, and I totally identified with your description. And I was fascinated by, tell the story about how you decided to go to Radcliffe. Well, um, I worked like everybody when I was in junior high school it was the year that John F. Kennedy was running for president. It was 1960, I was in junior high mm -hmm. and uh, he had gone to Harvard and I said, I'm gonna to go to Harvard. So I rode away to Harvard and they said, you, they wrote me back. I was very excited. My grandmother had taught me, my grandmother is a kind of one of the heroines of the book. Absolutely, yeah. And I had great women, really great women in my family who were my, really my heroines. And um, she had taught me, which has been to summer showing me how to write a business letter, you know, to block lettering and so I could write away for anything. And I wrote to Harvard and I said, I'd like to attend your college, just like John F. Kennedy did. And how do I go about doing that?
and they wrote me back. I wish I had, I keep everything. I wish I had this letter. They wrote me back. Um, um, uh, uh, that that they don't accept women, but Radcliffe College did, and they gave me an address on Fay Street to write to. I wrote immediately, and they sent me back a um, a brochure that had um, women who had uh, that weren't just all blondes, but very decisively had women who were brunettes. I said, "That's me," and I I, I can't <laughs> have brunettes. <laughs> they didn't all look like Grace Kelly. There were sort of brunettes, kind of Joan Baez, sort of brunettes. Yeah. I'm I, and that was it. I just decided that's that's going to be what I'm going to do. And yeah, but you had other you had other ideas about what you had to do to get accepted. Yes, and I went to my school guidance counselor and I said, I want to go to Radcliffe. Harvard won't take me. Radcliffe is the is the girls part of Harvard, and she says, well. You know, you, in, in, I was at a very, very big uh, Brooklyn public high school. She said, well, to get into Radcliffe, you have to be number one in your class in junior high school and high school. And she said, but you should be able to do that. There were like, you know, thousands of people in the class and each. <laughs> she just said, well, you should be able to do that. And I just looked at her and I realized what was going to be involved I could see like the life <laughs> it was great. I mean it was really memorizing review books you know getting a hundred percent on every test I mean it was it was not a good life it made me feel you know I was really just you know it, it made me feel fraudulent because I was studying really for for instrumentally transactionally mm -hmm. to I was a long time to, to get out of that feeling of, of studying to, to get into Radcliffe. And, um, well, that's, that's so interesting. Um, and I, I uh, so you're, so what, ha you got in. I got in. And you're a, a fabulous mother and your amazing grandmother and your absolutely goddess aunt, Mildred. Yes. A single woman, career, car what we used to call a career, a career woman. woman. Yes. Uh, they huddled around and, you know, made, gave you a vehicle to the, you know, I mean, I think well, of them more, as kind of gathering around and, more than you know. This, more than this, my mother was dying. Of well, was, when did that, but that didn't, you didn't know that until you got to Radcliffe. No, I right? never knew. When I uh -huh. was nine years old, she became very ill and she knew that her trajectory was oh. not good. And she didn't want me to know. Oh. She lived nine years longer and she didn't wow. want me to know she was wow. sick because she wow. thought that if I knew she was sick, I wouldn't go away to Radcliffe. And she was, mm. I'm sure she was right. Yeah. And so really part of- What a story, gift. Part of the story is my mother giving me this gift but then, of course, my guilt and how I worked through this guilt of my not being there for my mother. Yes. Uh, so it's a well, so, yeah, and that was just like one that. of the ways that you felt uneasy yeah. at, at, at Radcliffe. And um, you have a, a short section uh, yes. to read. Yes, I do. So this is a, this is a section about... Um, coming to Radcliffe and feeling as though I didn't belong there. At Radcliffe, I wanted to feel a part, but there were moments that made me aware of how much I was seen as an outsider. In spring of freshman year, there was a series of thefts in Holmes Hall. That was my freshman dorm. Someone was stealing small bills, anything that was left in sight, not locked up. There was an investigation, an all door meeting. The house masters explained that the person who was doing this needed help. She should come to them and seek help. We were told that the mystery of who was stealing the money was never solved, but I was shocked to overhear in a lunch conversation a hint that several people thought it was me. I didn't have close friends, but why would people see me as a thief? I approached Lynn, a tall, studious blonde, and I asked her this question point blank. I trusted her. Like me, she was quiet. Unlike me, she had a roommate with whom she was close, so she never 
isolated. Lynn was forthright. In Holmes Hall, you needed coin, the payphone, and the machine. Lynn said that I was the person who most often asked other people for change. I thought that might be right. When I was lonely, asking for change was a way to have a quick visit. I see that it might have been irritating, unwelcome, and perhaps I did it more than I thought. I waited for more evidence of my being a criminal. There was none. Lynn described the group thinking. I was someone who was so isolated that she needed excuses to come into other girls' rooms to feel a part of things. Perhaps I would take their stuff as another way to feel connected. My eyes smarted. Lynn said she had no reason to think I'd ever stolen anything, but she thought I should know how I was coming off. I didn't sputter or defend myself. I was able to put myself in the place of all those girls in the middle of their conversations when I came looking for change. I could imagine their annoyance and could put myself in Lynn's place. She was brave. I thanked her. Lynn said she would have been happy to talk if I just knocked on her door and asked to chat. I told her I would have been afraid to do that because she seemed so close with her roommate and I knew she had a famous dad. I thought her life must be so different from mine. She shrugged. We started to talk. Lynn taught me something about empathy. It's not just listening. She stayed with me. She made sure I took something positive from our conversation. I talked about learning from review books in high school and how they made me feel that I hadn't learned the real thing. I think she talked about the ups and downs of growing up with a well-known parent. I didn't talk about Sherry Zimmerman or my adoption. I didn't begin a new life in the sunlight, but I'd taken a risk in reaching out to another person and she hadn't let me down. I knew I would try again. I realized how much I wanted to talk to other people. I wanted to hear their stories. I had heard too little of life. Oof. So beautiful. What a beautiful reading and what a story and hearing it in your voice. I mean, I'm just like there in those Radcliffe dormitories in that kind of slightly alienating, you know, scary, or, you know, do I belong here thing? Because I don't think any of us felt we belonged there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, whether, you know, let alone that our relatives have started the place or whatever, you know, it was still it was this kind of temple and who belonged there? Nobody. I mean, there was this- seen you with somebody who belonged there. Well, uh, and I would have seen you with all your kind of assertiveness going to meet those professors and, um, you know, doing special projects and all that. I thought she's a real Radcliffe girl. I'm just a whatever, you know, I mean, um, Maybe this memoir is really about adolescence. Well, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's correct that adolescence is known as a rite of passage, right? To survive adolescence is a rite of passage. Traditionally, I think what's unusual now is that there's a generation of women, you and me and others, who are telling stories of women who had a rite of passage into a different kind of adult womanhood, into careers, into real lives of work uh, in the world and, you know, changing the world. And um, that's new, you know, and you mentioned, we haven't talked about this, but you mentioned Jill Kerr Conway in your uh, book as, as a mentor of yours. And I read, I gobbled those books of hers, that the, the first one, especially, because it was the true life of a woman who, you know, didn't kill herself uh, and, you know, stop writing her poems or, you know, write her poems and then kill herself. And I was, I was writing poems. Um, so this book uh, really, in a way, it's about a different kind of adolescence, um, at the boundary of a different kind of woman, or maybe it's the same adolescence and how do you make 
your way into the life you know that that you did and and what you do which is so interesting it, there is a kind of uh zelig uh i have it too you know it's it's like so she goes to paris after 1968 and and she meets lacan and <laughs> becomes his pal sort of and uh you know this one and that one and it's like oh my god what a life you know and when you talk you know you're very uh what what i love about it is that you're very modest about you present these people as actual people uh it reminds me a little of deirdre bear's wonderful memoir of writing about beckett and de beauvoir and yes, yes. you know meeting beckett yeah. in cafes and his the kind of sweater he wore and stuff i mean it has that wonderful down-to-earth uh quality but it's also just amazing and also that's when your your brain starts starts beginning to make your work and we talked a little uh, in in our Zoom getting to know each other life about this kind of liminality of that time of 1968. And why don't you talk a little about that? Well, 68, um, you know, it used to be you'd say 68 and everybody would go, oh, we, 68, so I said, we, you know, and everybody would know. Right. It, but now you can't sort of assume in 68, there was a student um, movement really across all of Europe and in the United States as well in 68. Uh, but more really in, in Europe, uh, there was a student and worker uh, movement where um, in the French case, for example, there was a, a strike, people stopped working, people stopped going to school, people really questioned things about uh, the French family, the French relationship to uh, authority, uh, uh, the French uh, church, uh, how they would run the university, everything seemed up for grabs. You know, it didn't last for long. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really didn't change society for um, uh, in, in many profound ways. But one thing it did do, it did make people for the period, let's say of May, June, July 68, um, feel as though everything was kind of betwixt and between, that you, that, that you didn't, uh, sexuality, uh, how political organizations would be run, the kinds of relationships that children would have with their parents, that students would have with faculty. Every, liminality is what, it's a phrase that Victor Turner, who I studied with at the University of Chicago uses to describe periods when things are really up for grabs. And it reminds me very much of what we have now. Yeah, um, I was gonna the, say, yeah, period, talk about that some. The period of the pandemic, when um, I don't think we're even aware sometimes of how much we feel at sea and how much really the things, you know, certainly politically we're aware that political norms have changed, things we couldn't believe are happening, could happen, are happening. Uh, things are being said loud, we, we would have considered unspeakable in political discourse. We don't know what the rules are, it's very unsettling. We don't know what the rules for work are. Can we really tell our companies that we'd, uh, I was just speaking with a, with someone today who said a very big company had asked their workers, well, you know, how many of you uh, would like to come back to work? And if you were expecting to come back to work time and month, very few were expecting wow. to come back time to the office. And, you know, and what's that company going to do? Say, well, I don't care. You know, and right. you know, so I think very we really don't know uh, what the rules are going to be because companies may say, well, you know, that kind of suits us because we can right. save some money that way. So we right. we sort of don't know what work is going to be like, what school is going to be like. I mean, we 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 are we are sort of at sea, and in those moments, um, are moments where there's possibility obviously for chaos, but there's also possibility according to Turner and historically for really creative, exciting change. And well, I, I mean, and you saw it actually yeah. with Black Lives Matter Absolutely. Uh, coming up in the middle of the pandemic. And there was a kind of festivity yes. about those uh, demonstrations that did remind me of 1968. Yes. Um, and this kind of, 
uh, and the, you know, the mixed race quality of it, which everybody has forgotten, also happened in 1968. Um, and uh, you know, the, the sort of combination of the two things is really, really interesting. Right. So I think we're at, a, we're at a moment when it's easy to see the chaos. And Turner would say, you know, it's always easy to see the chaos and be afraid of the chaos. But if you take from a social science point of view, the, the idea that the, the study and the mobilization of these moments of liminality is itself something to focus on and be creative about. And yeah. apply yourself to that. There's really a moment of opportunity, and I—that's something I'm giving a lot of, you know, thought now to as to how to uh, really mobilize that and be deliberate uh, about that. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's well. Who knew you didn't know anything about that when you were writing this book, uh, right? Well, um, yeah. No, I did. In other words, liminality is something I've been studying. No, no, no. You knew about liminality, but you didn't know that you're what a that a gigantic cultural shift was going to take place just as you finished this book. Right? Um, I was finishing this book during the pandemic. Oh, you were. I was, and I think the discerning reader can pick up the parts <laughs> that were written. Um, uh, I, I want to say mid pandemic. <laughs> right. I, you know, I sort of like felt um, I didn't, I didn't want to do sort of like, oh, here's my pandemic epilogue or something. I didn't want to. Right. Do that. No. But I did sort of go through the book and try to infuse um, the book oh. with the, the sensibility of someone who was living through a time of, um, change. So, well, I guess I was so in it that I didn't even, I mean, it certainly doesn't, it definitely doesn't feel as if it was written before the, you know, no, you I know, this try, time, but I tried, um, had a lot of, I had a lot of editorial support to just, yeah. just kind of brace it a little bit, um, in a way, uh, with the, the feeling that potentially, we're in a moment of change. And actually it was made easier for me, both by my editorial support, uh, but also by um, the fact that I'm living, I'm not gonna, it's a, you'd see just a black screen if I turn this, the computer, but I'm living in Provincetown, uh, really uh, on the beach that Thoreau walked. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, he wrote about living deliberately and using, um, using solitude as a way to uh, think about living deliberately. And, yes. And I, I think that there was something about finishing the book, uh, you know, infused with reading a lot of Thoreau, being on his beach, thinking about the mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it, it put me definitely in that frame of mind. Well, it ha definitely has that purity of voice. I mean, it, I, the other thing about memoir, I think, is that we, when one gets into the kind of memoir writing mode, I, I've been thinking about this because I'm not in it right now. Um, it, it's a kind of quality of solitude that's unlike any other. I mean, it is a kind of, it's a kind of enshrouding of solitude and you kind of reach out of it for, you know, I remember I was getting to a point where my mother is in a mental hospital and I realized it had been a kind of positive thing in the end. And I thought, am I crazy? Am I just idealizing this? And I, I reached out to Michael Palmer, a poet named Michael Palmer. I said, hey, Michael, would you talk to me please about the R.D. Lang? And, you know, we had the, could you meet me? And it, it, we met on a bench and he, it talked about R.D. Lang. And it, but, you know, I didn't ever talk about R.D. Lang, you know, and, and it is that quality of working on a memoir where you kind of, go out and and look for what you need and it's so interesting that that Thoreau of all people would be a model for you I wonder if there's anything you want to say about the we're we're getting close to time for questions I wondered if there's anything you want that I've forgotten that or that you want to say about the book 
to all of us before we open it up. Well, I had a, I had a question uh, to you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that you know I did in preparation for this is, you know, Honor has written a book about her mother, which is, um, and both of us lost our mothers too young. Right. And I resolved my loss by idealizing my mother and then taking a lifetime. You know, that question about why did you write this book? I mean, it was a way to really to find my mother through writing this book. And Honor, um, Honor's mother gave her the materials for a book that Honor's mother didn't get a chance to finish. Um, so I was just going to ask you as somebody who read my book as my way of sort of reconciling with my mother, if you'd just like to say just a word about how it felt to try to reconcile with your mother, again, somebody you lost too young. And what did it feel like to read somebody else's struggle with that really a very similar issue? Yes, well, I, I mean, I, I, I think they would have really gotten along, your mother and my mother, even though they came from, you know, different, they both had black hair, you know, but they, they would have gotten along. But they were both I, I discovered my mother as a friend. I mean, I discovered her as another woman as opposed to kind of the tragic figure I'd lost. Uh, and I sense that in, in your book too. I sense this, uh, suddenly what they do is they, we get out from under the motherness of them and we see them whole. And, and they um, arise, they emerge and arise out of, out of the stories that we tell. Uh, and it's a kind of great triumph and victory. I actually, think uh, it's something I want to think about more that there's a, a stage between mothers and daughters that I think a lot of um, daughters are getting to live now because their mothers have had fulfilled lives, fulfilled work lives. And, and they there's a new state that I, I don't know, the third stage of motherhood or something where you're friends, you know. Uh, and uh, I think it's something that that is sort of hinted at in both our, both our books. Yeah. I wonder if people have questions and I wonder if I can figure out how to do it here. Are we ready for questions? Now, where is it on my iPad? Uh, by the Empathy Diaries, it's saying, let's see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've got, I've just, uh, Katie, I think you're going to have to do the questions because I can't find it on my iPad. Oh, wait a second. No yeah, and that's no problem if you can't, if you can't find it. It should be, there should be a little icon somewhere that you can click on. I have an icon that says like participants. Test. I have an icon that says... Yeah, it should, it should be in that same spot, but if you can't find it, I have no problem running the Q&A for you. <laughs> okay, why don't you do it? Why yeah, don't you yeah. do it? Sure thing. Um, okay. We do I get to see Sherry, though? Oh, there you um, go. Yeah, can I'm, we be <laughs> gallery and, so we can see Sherry, Yeah, too? yeah, we, everybody should, should be able to be seen. Um, so let's see. The first question is from Larry Rosenberg. Uh, Sherry, do you know why your mom asked you to hide that you are not a Turkle from your own half siblings? And how did they respond to your sharing that you are not a full sibling? Um, my mother didn't want anyone to know about her divorce. She thought that was shameful. And, the, and she wanted, uh, that was her in her mind. She felt that was just, that was a shameful part. That was a shameful thing that had happened to her. And then later, as I discovered, I don't know how much spoiler alert I want to do in the, here, there's a kind of, um, there's a reveal of who my father is, um, uh -huh. I'm gonna say. It, um, uh, she was afraid of him. And uh, she really couldn't deal with who he was, but um, just leaving it at, she didn't want anyone to think that the, Turkle, that I wasn't a Turkle, a full sort of Turkle. Um, and uh, she didn't, she wanted my, uh, ha my half siblings to think that Milton Turkle was my father. Mm -hmm. um, when the Fortune magazine um, 
a gentleman uh, left my office and I realized I behaved like a nut job. And I called uh, both my, of my half siblings. Um, uh, it turns out that Milton Turkle had uh, been angry that I hadn't um, thanked him in the acknowledgments of my uh, book. Uh, and he had just told them about that I was their half sibling. So it was oh kind God. of like, by that point, it was kind of like, um, uh, I mean, you know, it was like all these things that you may keep a secret all your life. It was like, so? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the, one of the, um, one of the great lessons of my book is that when you keep a family secret all your life and it comes out, it's like, uh-huh. Yeah. So, and like, what, <laughs> yes. And where, and where's the, <laughs> right. and where's the secret here? You know. Right. So I I went through this tremendous anxiety and stress for pretty much not much. Mm. Hiding my name and did they know and who knew and. Well, and also I think the name is important. So I think it's at the core of one's feeling of wholeness and identity. You know. Yeah. And what's really amazing, in case there are any listeners out there who don't think there's an unconscious, you know, Freud is dead. And you know, I, the first book I wrote, and I spent certainly 10 years studying this theorist's work, was a psychoanalyst whose big famous theory was le nom du père, the name of the father. And I studied this guy's work, like not even making the connection that that was, wow. that that was like the story of my life. And then finally, at one point in the book, like I'm, you know, taking notes in his seminar, Le Nom du Père, the name of the father. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> right, really? Wow. So when, peop when people like say, I don't think there's an unconscious, that's like this 19th century bullshit. I go, mm, not so fast. <laughs> not so fast, right. <laughs> Um, our next question is from Stephen Cantor. Have you written anything specifically about the liminality of the present moment? No, I think that's my. It, it, actually, I in the in the empathy diaries there. I, it, I I start to write about that, and there's an essay I have written. So it's in the limit. It's in the um, there's an s. There's a part of the. Um, uh, the uh, Empathy Diaries, where it is. And then there's an essay that I, I think that's about to be published as part of the launch of the book. Um, I know Stephen Cantor and I email me and I'll tell you when it's gonna come out that is specifically about this that I wrote specifically for the launch. Great. Our next question is from Sam Mitchell. Has the pandemic changed any fundamental ways you're thinking about technology? Yes, yes. I think that um, having lived through this, we are thirsty for the full embrace of the human. And the next mm -hmm. time somebody comes along and says, let me sell you a school system that's like all on a screen. Uh, it'll be so cheap, it'll be so fabulous. All you need is like every kid to have a Surface, you know, computer or something. We're gonna say not so fast. My kid needs a mentor, my kid needs a person, a, a real person, a mentor, be um, because we know the limits of what screens can do. We've had a very profound experience. You don't need people like me, like writing, you know, writing you a fancy essay about the limitations right. of screens. You just have to think about your experience of the limitations of screens. And I think that that profound experience moving forward is going to allow us to be much more deliberate as we move forward. So I'm optimistic that my way of thinking, which has not been ever anti-technology, it's always been pro-conversation, pro-people, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be a much easier sell. I'm very optimistic about my point of view being very... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like been there, done that. You know, we yeah, I'm screens. right, exactly. I'm very yeah. optimistic that my point of view is gonna, that I'm going to have a new popularity uh, wave because I think, I, I mean, you know, so much of my uh, story 
in my success, my learning in the book is populated by mentors, teachers who said, sit down, let me talk to you. I, you know, I believe in you. Let me talk to you. Let me help you. That's a bad idea. Let me help you make it better. Right. And I think that that is the essence of um, that is the essence of what kids need. And that's exactly what doesn't work that well uh, on that's the screen. Strange. Yeah. Interesting. This makes um, me very excited, as you see. I'm <laughs> this is really. Well, it's we thrilling, you know, it's topics. thrilling. Yeah. Already. We've got another question about um, uh, COVID, the sh shift from COVID times. This one's from Christine Seitz. It says, uh, as someone who has argued in favor of solitude throughout her career, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed the ways you perceive solitude? What advice would you give to those who have felt disconnected from their peers, whether it be in the virtual workspaces or educational settings? Well, um, when I've argued for solitude, I haven't meant this. So uh, <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me just, you know, I, I haven't meant Make solitary. I haven't meant, I've meant solitude, not solitary confinement. So um, I've argued for solitude as a capacity uh, where you feel whole within yourself so that you when you meet someone else, they know that because you feel whole within yourself, complete, you know, a certain kind of sense of completeness, you're not kind of looking to them to tell you who you are. Uh, the way psych the psychoanalytic tradition sums it up is that if you don't teach your children to be alone, they'll only know how to be lonely. In other words, you have to mm -hmm. teach your children to have a certain sense of containment, capacity for containment in order to relate fully to other people. That's my argument for solitude. It's the capacity to be content enough with your own, in your own skin that you can really listen when somebody else is talking and not just project your own needs onto them. That's not what, don't go out, don't touch, don't, you know, that. <laughs> so, the, um, so we need to uh, learn how to be with each other uh, again and learn that whole balance again, but let no one think that what I was arguing for is what I've had this year. No, 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 no. Let, let <laughs> no, 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 it's not, this has not been the implementation of my, of my medicine, no, no. <laughs> Um, from Ben Sherman, uh, we have, can you tell ben us German. about, <laughs> shout out, that's my, that's my, um, son-in-law. Oh, hello, son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> he, he asks, can you tell us about the significance, uh, of the book cover pictures? Yes. Oh my goodness. Oh. Here we've got it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um. I'm the most fortunate of authors uh, because um, Penguin, my wonderful editor, Jenny Yance, and God of Penguin, uh, when I said I didn't like the first cover, they said, not to worry, <laughs> here's the second version. And um, I, I believe this book is about evocative objects, objects that really, um, have meant something to me and they kind of anchored my life. So the middle picture is me uh, in what I call my Nancy Drew red, um, my Nancy Drew red roadster. Nancy Drew is a very big character in this um, book. She's one of my inspirations. Uh, Nancy Drew, Elizabeth Bennett uh, were I would say my two formative literary influences, um, both books that my grandmother and Joe Marsh, of course, my grandmother bought me these books at Macy's. Um, uh, the th first three books, the first books I ever had. Um, and then there's a picture of a, um, the, if you read the book, you'll know that you should be able to like get this as like a, you know, this is like the test. The next is my biological father who took me 
on a mysterious uh, rowboat ride in Prospect Park Lake, one of the few memories I have of him. And this is a, a rendering of that kind of dreamscape. This is the, a picture of a letter that my mother, one of the few letters that I have that my mother um, wrote to me when I was traveling in Europe. Uh, this is her generosity of the, in the last year of her life. She let me go to Europe, again, not knowing she was dying. This was the last summer of her life. And this is the letter she, one of the many letters she wrote to me during that year. Then there's the, this is the cover of a Nancy Drew mystery novel. And then the final, the final uh, outer um, evocative object, the most precious to me, are my grandmother's fancy dishes. They're called Thun dishes. They're a Czechoslovakian china um, that her mother bought for her as a wedding gift on the Lower East Side. Yeah. And my grandmother said that these dishes were the only thing she had that was precious that would outlive her. She believed that her, mm. not only her grandchildren, me, but her grandchildren's daughter would eat on these dishes. Mm. And Ben Sherman and my daughter, his wife, my daughter, Rebecca Sherman, both in the audience, we do eat on these dishes. We eat on these dishes for all special occasions. We eat on them for Passover, for their engagement party, for Thanksgiving, for you know, any special um, moment. And if they were here with me tonight, we would be definitely eating on these dishes. And when they come home after COVID, we will celebrate on these dishes. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the- Wow, I'm so happy to have that 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 journey. I'm so glad Ben asked that question. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad I asked that question. It's a beautiful image. I'm, and I'm, so, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful grateful, grateful for the, uh, for the opportunity to have this beautiful cover. It means really so much to me. Um, our next question is from Stephen Smith. We probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, he's wondering how your work on evocative objects might have informed your memoir. Because it, I, I teach I, evocative objects. I wrote a book. I edited a book called Evocative Objects. I've been studying the role of objects in, um, in people's lives for 20 years, 30 years, maybe since college. Uh, and evocative objects are objects that carry with them, uh, um, as I say, supercharged with emotions, feelings, uh, history, and the book is chock-a-block with my evocative objects. And one, I was gonna, actually one of the answers to the question that Honor posed, why'd you write this book? It was like, well, I've been writing about evocative objects all my academic career, why not mine? Right. Not mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and one of the early drafts of the book had one evocative object per chapter. That was one mm -hmm. of I was thinking of actually organizing it. One of the main, Heroines of the book is a, is a Smith Corona electric portable typewriter that my grandmother buys me when I go away to college. Um, I don't, I have to borrow, have to stand in line and borrow an old typewriter because I didn't have a typewriter in college. And uh, um, Honor and I actually had a conversation about this that she kind of felt that that's, that was a moment in reading the book that she could see that we weren't from the same place that she couldn't, would you want to say what you felt? Well, I just, it never occurred to me that it was possible to not afford a typewriter. I mean, it deeply, deeply shocked me. Um, it's just a class blindness, privilege blindness thing, but it was, so it was very moving to me when uh, your grandmother gives you the typewriter and Yes, the, the typewriter, especially the, the, the color of it is taupe. And there is something, the sound of the word taupe has a kind of comfort to it. So I was always very happy when the typewriter turned up, the taupe 
typewriter? You the always call it the taupe typewriter. The taupe typewriter turns up whenever I need comfort. Yeah. Um, with me, it, you know, it's not here on the Cape, but it's with me at, at home in, in Boston. I mean, the taupe, yeah. you know, because if you use a typewriter as opposed to a computer to write, yeah. fun fact, um, you have to think of the sentence before you write it. Mm. And as a writer, this is very hard, but sometimes it can be a very good thing. Yeah, it's and interesting. It as a, it's very interesting. And whenever I use the typewriter, my grandmother really is with me. So I have her mm. dishes, I have her typewriter. Uh, but, but if Marie Kondo said, do these things spark joy? They spark joy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, right. Well, we're just about out of time, but I do want to ask one more question because a couple different people have asked this same, essentially the same question. So I want to get to that before we wrap up. Um, which is how has exploring your relationship with your mother helped you think about your relationship with your own daughter? Uh, I tell my daughter the truth. I, I tell my daughter the truth. Sometimes I think too much. Uh, growing up, sometimes she would say, you know, this expression, TMI, like, <laughs> really? do we really? <laughs> and I've tried to back off. Uh, so I think you can err on the other side of, um, um, you know, you can err on the side of too much. But, but my mother lied, you know, she, I, had a, I had a lie about my name, I had a lie about my father, I had a lie about, and she lied about everything. My mother thought she was too tall. She was beautiful. She, the book has beautiful pictures of my mother, this tall, statuesque, magnificent. She was almost six feet tall. And by the time I found, she found people at the Division of Motor Vehicles who would let her say that she was shorter than she really was because she thought it was not sexy to be that tall. So by the time she was like, you know, I found her final uh, license. I mean, she, I think they, she'd gotten herself down to like 5'8 or 5'7. <laughs> she wasn't 5'7. She, was like, she was like, you know, 5'11 or 6'8. <laughs> but she just, you know, she like wow. lived in a parallel universe where, you know, she, she could be not, she, my name could be Sherry Turkle if it was Sherry Zimmerman. She didn't have to be, I mean, so wow. I, I, re I really have gone with truth telling perhaps more than was necessary. <laughs> but that's Rebecca's story to tell, not mine. Yeah. Well, Hunter and Sherry, I wanna thank you both so much for that fantastic discussion. And thanks to everybody in the audience for joining us. And if you missed any of tonight's event or if you just wanna watch it again, we will be posting it to our YouTube channel. So please look out for it there. And don't forget to buy your copy of The Empathy Diaries in store or online at greenlightbookstore.com. And our revolution. And yes, our revolution. That is, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>